Good morning. Men and women of faith, how are we this morning? Good. You guys are here. That's good. You know, all those camping people out there heading for adventures, who knows. But I am so thankful you guys are here today uh, to hear God's Word and to think on God's Word. I'm going to start us off in a word of prayer. Father God, uh, you have been faithful to your people throughout history, Father. Uh, You have shown God, us, your steadfast love. I pray that today, uh, Lord, that we would show our steadfastness to you and that we would have faith in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Last week was Awana Sunday. Pretty fun and and adventurous and loud. Uh, Maybe a little toned down this week. But last week we shared about the armor of God. And I pray that this past week that you guys put on the armor of God daily that you remember to go through those things. And if you didn't, we'll, we'll help you pull out some of those fiery darts that might have zinged you throughout the week. Because that's where we're here today, to fellowship, to come together, to help one another out, and to honor God. One of the items that we did talk about was the shield of faith and the idea of standing behind a strong faith, that we have faith in God and the things that He's doing Today we're going to go to Hebrews 11, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Hebrews, it's in the New Testament. If you don't have a Bible, we have a lot of good ones in the back, all different kinds. I think there's some camel Bibles maybe back there too. You know, um, earlier today we heard from our various missionaries, and I, I want to encourage us to continue to keep on... Co- Keep in contact with them. You know, Miss Kim sets up an email if you guys are able to get on that. That's an incredible thing because she'll send out emails and you get how to pray for people right now and, and to be doing that. You know, and as a, as a kid, we would have missionaries visit our church every so often. We're having the coils come. And I remember as a kid thinking, like, these are like the major, le- it's like the, someone famous at your church. Right, the missionaries are coming, and, and we would have this. It was almost like the major league baseball player coming and visit. You're like, can I get your autograph? And they're like, that's odd for this little kid to, you know. But but we we treated them as such. We we looked at them and and we were so excited to have these missionaries serve. I remember there was this one missionary that came and he was so cool. You couldn't even tell his first name because of where he lived. So we went by Victor, and, and he wanted to stay at our house, and we played foosball with him. But he went by Victor, and so we always asked him stories like, you know, did you, have you seen angels? Have, have you been, you know, attacked? Have, have this happened? And we just we kept wanting to get more and more things and, because we wanted to hear, what we wanted to hear is the faith that they had. That's kind of what, what attracts us to, to those missionaries, um, that they would be stepping out in faith. Now, I can attest to the fact, I have a little brother up there that that spoke today, uh, that that faith in the missions field is just the same as us. It takes faith. Uh, um, You know, they may have stepped out a little bit further at times than we have, but it's still hard to have faith, especially in difficult times, when situations don't seem to be lining up the way that, like, Lord, I I planned this, right? You, You knew, we were working together, and then it kind of, falls apart, and, or God calls us to something, and we go, Lord, I, I can't do that. There's no way that, that that's going to be possible, and that stepping out in faith that he calls us to do, it's kind of like uh, I was painting on a ladder, and uh, we were painting our house, and when you look at the ladder, it doesn't look that high, so you get to the top of the ladder, and then you have to paint from the top of the ladder, and it feels a lot higher than you, what you think. Faith is kind of like that. It's easy to say, you know, someone else, yeah, you just got to have faith. You got to have do this. But when we're in a situation where God calls us to climb that ladder and you're shaking the whole way up and you're wondering, you know, is this, when was this ladder built? How, how, how sturdy is this? But God's calling us to that. He's calling us, us to have faith in those situations and to trust in Him um, and, and go through. So my, my prayer today for, for us is that I'd be able to encourage you, brothers and sisters, to have faith. 
in God. And we're going to look through, uh, look through Hebrews and see the idea of Paul, or potentially Paul who wrote it. There's a, there's a couple ideas of who might have written it. Um, it's going to talk through people of faith. So the context of Hebrews. So we're in Hebrews 11 today. Hebrews is a great book. Hebrews actually, and our ladies are studying through Hebrews right now. And it's a cool book because what Hebrews does is it takes the Old Testament and it brings it into the New Testament. The author, potentially again Paul, is, is looking at uh, what faith is and using parts and pieces. You, you may have heard it said that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I like to think of it that way. Um, and we had a conversation about Chuck Missler, for any of you guys... I love that guy. And he talks so much about seeing Christ in the Old Testament. But Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, what he's trying to do is make a case for how we can bring that Old Testament into the New Testament piece. And so he's going to share about some of the men and women of faith. Now, uh, so let's, let's turn to uh, chapter 11, verse 1 says this, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old receive their uh, commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what was seen or is seen was not made out of things uh, that are visible. Dr. Oswald Sanders says this, he says, Faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. So for us as believers, this is a, this is a great thing. That we can, we can trust God enough to know that He has our future so, so trusted that, that it's happening right now. And that we can, those things that are unseen to us at this point, like the People in the Old Testament, they didn't see these things. That God was still moving through those. A future hope. You know, it, it's easy to, uh, actually it's difficult to put faith in the context of God. You know, we struggle with this. When we talk with people and they go, you know, like, how can you believe in, in God? Like, really? Like, you haven't gotten over that point? Or you haven't, you haven't, you haven't been, so smart that you haven't figured out like that it's kind of a scam. And, and we hear these pieces and we realize that in a, in a God context, it's hard for people to have faith in a God context. But realistically, we all have faith in things all the time, right? In different areas, in different situations. Gravity. We all have faith in gravity. This is, I could prove this because if I jumped out in this front row at Mike up in the front, he would dodge. He would jump out of the way. Or he'd try and catch me. I don't know. <laughs> He's a good friend sometimes. But, but we, have, we have faith in gravity that it's, you know, things go up, things come down. Sometimes things fall a little harder. Sometimes things fall more often. You know, us, those of us that trip a lot, we know gravity and we have faith and, and we trust in gravity. You do it with stoplights. That you go through the green light, you have faith that someone's not going to T-bone you. Now, does that happen at times? Yeah, sure, I guess. But we have faith in the things around us. Uh, you go to, the, uh, you go to a, a burger shop and you eat, eat burgers or eat lunch or whatever. You have faith that the person behind the counter is doing the job that they needed to. They're not, you know, losing Band-Aids in your burger or something like that. You have faith, I know gross, but it's happened. I know. <laughs> right? We have a little bit of faith, I guess, that, that we hope. And that's the thing, though. People put, the, their, they actually put their faith in the wrong things. We're all, every single human being on this planet is, a, we say, you know, oh, you're a man of faith. Well, actually, everybody believes and has faith in something. But we have to realize, what, it, what do we have faith in? Proverbs says it like this. It says, when we put our faith in anything other than God, it is like eating with a broken tooth. And so we keep biting that side. I know this because I've had a, a tooth that I need to go in and I keep pushing it off. And I, every time I can only eat on this side of my face, 
And every time I'd try and go to this side of my face, it's like, oh, okay, I, I remember. So I'm trusting. I don't know why I just don't just go in. But I'm trusting in the wrong things. That at one point, it's going to you know, magically be better. That's my hope. I hope it just heals itself. That's not going to happen. But um, the idea is that we, as believers, we need to have faith in God and God alone. And we need to examine our lives to think, where do I have faith in this world? Where am I putting faith in other things that end up being broken teeth? And I bite that same one again, and man, it stings, and it hurts. And I thought at first it was going to be fine, but in the end, things start breaking down. There's an idea of patient endurance. That's the key word that we need to have with our faith. It's a patient endurance. It's, it's going, okay, Lord, I know you've promised these things, and I've, I've seen it in your scripture. We heard our psalm today. Lord, I, I, I'm at the end of my rope. What, what's happening right now? It's that patient endurance, knowing, God, you're good. So we're going to, looking later on in verse 4, it's going to give some examples of men and women. Hebrews 6.12, just before this, um, you can turn there if you'd like. We're going to jump back, back to our, our Hebrews chapter. But 6.12 says this. It says that, uh, so it says that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. This is why we read our Bibles. As we go through our Bibles in our Old Testament to, to look how people acted. Because it's a real, it's, it's not like a fairy tale. And you see that reading through the scriptures. You see truth in it because these, there are some very messed up people in the Bible. Just like there are very messed up people. Just like we need a Savior and are messed up. And so you see this truth. And you see what, how people interact and what they do through that. So, chapter 11, jumping back to verse 4, it says this. It says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his face, faith, though he died, he still speaks. Abel had faith that in his sacrifice, God would provide for him. Abel chose the correct things to sacrifice to God. Abel chose a blood sacrifice that was, you know, we hear in, in earlier in Genesis, that was the correct sacrifice. And Abel knew that, and he... he correctly gave to God what he was what God had ordained. Cain, so you look at Cain on the other hand, um, he did not sacrifice correctly. He sacrificed smaller amount or, or a different amount or a less a poor offering we might say. And so Abel trusted God with his sacrifice. Cain was going to hold back some of that and not trust God with the sacrifice that he had. Cain acted like he was sacrificing to God. He did, you know, he, he was, okay, Lord, here's, here's your thing. I'm going to give this to you. But really, in his heart, he was still holding things back. We do this sometimes. You know, we, we act like or we try and look like we're making a sacrifice for God, but we're still holding things back from him. And we might try and do it when people are looking or, you know, to see or look at my sacrifice. But Abel gave his first fruits, the best, right? The, the, the first thing that he wanted to give because he knew that God would provide for him. He was sacrificing his best. Now, I would ask you to do the same. Are you sacrificing your best? Or the weird leftovers in the back of the fridge? Is that what you're bringing to God? When God shows up at your house for a meal, are you getting out the, we've got this big green, or this egg thing that I can kind of barbecue on sometimes if I get it right. But, but you know, I want to prepare the finest meats for God. I want to give God my first and my best. And we, we try and teach our, our kids that idea. 
just to come to the table and say, Lord, okay, here you go. I made this for you. I had a kid one time at school. I love, I, I teach. And so I get kids that bring me goodies from home. I have to have a little faith in their kitchen, whatever's going on at home. And I, a kid came up one time and he was this little cute uh, Hispanic kid. And he said, Mr. Anion, my mom made some tamales for you. They're in my, they've been in my backpack. <laughs> so, okay. And he, he takes, he goes to his backpack and there's this, there's this bag of sweaty tamales. And he sets them down on my desk. And he goes, I don't like them, but my mom told me to give them to you. Like, and, and I'm like, oh, thanks, bud. You know, I'll, I'll make sure and you know, do something with that. And he's like, no, I want you to eat them now. Why don't you try them? Okay, okay, Marcos, I'll, I'll, I'll try a little, like open it up. And he's, he's just watching me the whole time, right? But he, he wasn't giving his, me his best. He was giving me a bag of sweaty tamales that, you know, I, I took a couple bites and said, oh, that's, that's great. You know, we'll, we'll figure out something to do with that, buddy. But I, I would ask you not to do that with God. I would ask you to give him your first. And this is hard, that sacrifice that, that we, we go, God, do I really have to give this up for you? Is this, but, but think about it, first of all, that God owns it all, right? And so it's more, he doesn't need, he doesn't need it, but he's asking us to give because he wants to see our hearts and the sacrifices that we're making. The missionaries that we have, have sacrificed comfort, safety, uh, their basic needs because they have faith that God will provide for those things. And if you've ever been able to spend time with these missionaries in the field that they're doing, you see this. You see the things that they're enduring patient endurance, because they have faith that God will do a, a work in them and, and through their sacrifices. And God uses our sacrifices to reveal our hearts. He uses our sacrifices to reveal the things. What are we willing to give up for Him? Say, no, I'm not, this is not, I'm, I'm not willing to give this up. This is the good stuff. You know, Jackie's parents have a saying, my wife's parents, they say, hide the good stuff. The kids are coming, you know. It's kind of a joke, but you get the idea and the flavor of that. The idea is that we want to put out the good stuff because it shows our hearts and it reveals our hearts. Let's take a look at verse 5, jumping down. Verse 5 tells us that by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The event of Enoch, I mean again, this isn't fairy tale stuff. This really truly happened. Enoch is walking with God. It said, he was faithful for 365 years. And, um, you know, the, the idea that God took Enoch up. And I tried to look, think, you know, like, did he have a wife at that time? Like, hey, honey, I'll be right back. And then, you know, where did he go? Enoch. You know, but, I, you know, it looked like the context of that didn't happen. But 365 years, he had walked faithful with God. He had trusted him. He had, he had faith in what God was doing in his life. Now, also, it doesn't say that, God, that Enoch knew where God was taking him when, when they went out. He, God had called him, but he, I, I don't know. Maybe he didn't know where they were going and heading. You know, there's that joke that Enoch and God are on the walk, and God says, well, it looks like I'm closer to my house than yours. Let's go to my house, you know takes him home with him. But God's calling is kind of the same way in our lives. Sometimes he asks us to go and we don't know where he's taking us. We don't know where the end's going to, going to be. We don't know the things that are ahead of us in the path and what's going to happen. And, and this really scares people when we don't, you know, we like to kind of know where we're going most of the time. Uh, some of you otters out there maybe are like, oh, this, yeah, let's go. That's, I'm not one of those people. I'm like, I need to know 
What's the time? How are we going to get there? What's it look like? And I need to plan it out. Um, I don't always do a good job of that. In fact, when my wife and I got married um, to propose to her, we, uh, I, I had this brilliant plan. It's just foolproof plan. And it, it, it involved my car pretending to break down and her having to walk through the woods in the middle of the night. And I love my sweet wife, but she was as city, city as you can get at that point. And we're, we're at the top of the Pine Bluff Road, middle of nowhere, it's dark out, and I say, trust me, honey, it's, it'll be fine. Because I know at the end of it, I know at the end of it, that I'm gonna have Christmas lights and this whole deal, and I'm gonna propose to her, and it's gonna be the best thing ever. But at that point, when, I, when I'm saying, Come with me, honey. Have faith. She's like, mm -mm, nope, not going to happen. And I said, well, you can either stay in the car in the middle of the woods by yourself, or you can you know, stick close to me and we'll walk down the hill together. And she, you know, she fi finally got out. About halfway down the hill, there's some creature clawing up a tree. And I'm like, okay, Lord, buy it. some, I don't know, if it was a, who knows, porcupine or something. But that, she thought it was a grizzly bear. <laughs> Partially because I told her a, a story about a really big grizzly bear actually a few hours before that. But, you know, that, plan, that planning thing just doesn't. But, but God, God is calling us to things that we don't necessarily know the end. And we can kind of, we try to make sense of it, right? At the beginning, we go, okay, Lord, I can, I, maybe you're calling me to do this. And it, we get the kind of the shakes a little bit. Okay, Lord, let's, let's move forward. I was talking to a brother this week, and he said um, he had asked God where he wanted him to walk, and he had no idea where it would take him. And this, is a, uh, this story encouraged me so much, because he, the person that I was talking to, the path that God has placed them in, when he finally said, yes, Lord, I, I'm going to go on this walk with you. I know you've been banging at my door, and I, usually I'm saying, you know, nobody's home. I go, well, I know you're home, right? But he finally chose to open that door and say, you know what? Let's go on a walk, Lord. Let's go and see where God takes you. And you look back and you go, how did that happen? God, how did you do that? The way that you worked through those situations. So I would ask you guys to have faith. When God is calling you and knocking at your door, open the door. Put on your walking shoes. Head out, head out the door and walk with them because you have no idea where it will take you. I also want to say in a warning, the opposite is actually true when we don't draw near to God. And when we refuse to go with God and to go on our own, um, we find that we end up in places that we never thought imaginable. And we've seen brothers and sisters that unfortunately that that's the path that they have taken. Proverbs says it's the the houses of hell, or the chambers of death. And at first it looks nice and sweet, and we say, no, Lord, I've got a better plan. And then we realize in the end, that is not the plan. Right? We have that moment go, Lord, how did I get here? What's going on? I'm in a ditch, and I'm, I'm you know, could have been where I might, was taking Jackie down the hill and fall off the side or something. But looking down, let's, let's look at uh, verse 7. It says, continuing by faith, Noah being warned by God concerning the events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for, saving, for the saving of his household. <coughs> by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. So Noah, Noah builds an ark where there's not really an area that needs this giant ark, right? He's, he's building in the driveway. Sure, you know, people are going, what is that guy doing over there? What, 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 what did God tell you? What, okay, but why? And we hear that it was because of reverent fear for God, that he had faith in God, and that, Faith caused a fear, a reverent fear that he knew and he trusted God for his future. Remember, we as Christians, we get to see future as present. 
That's a great thing in hard times. Where you say, Lord, you're, you're coming back someday. That's, that's going to happen. That's a done deal. Sign, check, the whole way. We get to have our life like that. And not going, ah. we don't have to run around with our hair on fire because we know what God is doing. Would you do the same if God called you to build a giant boat in your driveway? Uh, probably not. I know. That's, that's good. Yeah, I would have a hard time. But if God called us to do those things, we need to be prepared and ready to do that and to be called and, and to, to work through that. And Noah also preached for 120 years without a single convert, day after day after day, continuing to let and to warn brothers and sisters. And I, I, again, we have to do this. We have to put it in the context of our own lives. You know, think about God calling you to do that. The next day you get out and let people know. And the next day, 120 years of that. And, and no one is, everyone is walking by and going, no, you're a fool, Noah. This is, this is ridiculous. But it was because of his fear for God that he knew him. So in whom do you fear? Who do you place your faith in? Are you willing Are you willing to look like a fool for God? The things that he is doing. And, and to, you know, this gets hard when we get into situations with, you know, maybe co-work unbelievers. And it, and it sounds so ridiculous. And they're going, no, you have to have faith. You've got to have faith in this stuff. You gotta have faith in the world that, that thing, these things, you know, I hear this sometimes and I'm like, things are gonna get better. Things are just gonna pick up and everything's gonna be just dandy. And I go, faith in the wrong thing. You have faith in the world. You don't have faith in our, our God. No, things are gonna get better, but it's gonna get worse and then God's gonna work through that situation because I have a fear of God. I have, a, I have a faith in Him, not of this world. So let's look at verse 8. Verse 8 says this. It says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place that he was to receive an inherit, as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in the tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, then, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as a good, uh, therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of the heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So here we have Abraham, one of the greatest men of faith in our Old Testament. And it says, he went out not knowing where he was going. And they left the comfort. It, you know, you have to realize, Abraham might have been one of the richest men of all, all of that during that time on earth. And God is calling him to go, to leave his, you know, nice tent and his camels and all that, you know, all that cushy stuff that he had set up to do. Doesn't God do that sometimes? You know, there's this, there's this idea, sometimes we build like a island. There's these games out here where you can like, you build your islands or your, you know, whatever it might be, farms or something like that. And you do these things and you get it all nice and it's all, all set up and you get your house all set up. I do this too. I go around and make things all nice and set up and, and then God might call you to leave that. Lord, I just set up. This is so nice. My, my com I'm comfortable, Lord. Don't, please don't call me out past this. But God does that. 
Because he wants us to have faith not in our own things, but he wants us to have faith in him. The idea of the island, you're making an island. And then you hop in, God calls you in a boat, you hop in the boat, and then he calls you to go out in the boat, and you start rowing. And there's a point in your faith where you can't see the island ahead of you, and you can't see the island behind you. And you're just kind of in this space, and you're going, Lord, where... Where, do you, where are you calling me right now? I don't, know, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know who I am. I don't know what you've planned. You hear this from our missionaries. You know, uh, my little brother, when they, call, when they were called out of Africa, they're going, what, what do you have for us, Lord? And then God calls us to a new island. We finally see, oh, man, oh, we jump, you know, and we, we're, we're excited. And we get there and we start setting up these things. And it's good to set up. God calls us to, to, to do that, to know his plans. And then we get it all nice and set up, our things all, and then God calls us to a, another island after that. Oh, okay, Lord. I think, you know, I think of Paul's life. That's, that was his life. God kept moving him. You know, shipwreck, snake bites, these things. Kept moving him from place to place and moving him. But he had faith. And he also didn't wait Abraham didn't wait to obey God. In fact, when it says that uh, with Isaac and he called him to sacrifice, it says he went the next morning. You know, there, there wasn't a waiting period there, which is probably good because Isaac probably would have tried to run away if, you know, you're going to do what, Lord? What, what are you asking me to do? But Abraham obeyed right away. So we have a thing with our kids and me sometimes. We say... Obey right away. And we, we teach our kids to obey right away. And we, we try and train them to do that. Because it's amazing, you know, the selective hearing that people have, people have myself included. Again, you know, honey, obey right away. I, I asked you to do something like that. I'm like, okay, let's do it. But it's this idea that we obey children, obey your parents without delay, so that one day, when you're grown up, that you would obey God without delay. When God tells you to go, you go, yep, Lord, I'm gone. Let's do this. I, I'm heading out. Where are we going? Where, what's heading? Well, I'm not going to tell you where we're going. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just going to go. And I'm going to move forward what you have for me. We want to train ourselves to do the same thing. When God calls us to do something, we want to say, okay, Lord, I'm going. I don't know where the end's going to lead. I don't know what... You know, that looks pretty like a wild ride, like sitting at the top of the, you know, Silverwood water park slide. And you're like, do I have to go down that? Yep, that's what God's called you to do. Move forward. If you've never done that, you may not want to, because it's really scary. <laughs> but God calls us to do things that don't make sense from our perspective. So what is God calling you to that you're waiting on? that you're trying to get your ducks in a row, just a little bit more. Lord, I need a little bit more. Now, this doesn't mean we just, you know, wherever my heart leads and I jump right into it, because that can be dangerous as well. We have to be in prayer and we have to ask God to guide us through, through those things. And we have to be good about discerning God's voice. How do we do that? We're in His Scripture. We're in His Word. We're in, in prayer. It's kind of like nails on a chalkboard for me when I hear these people like, I just followed the Lord and I followed God and he led me to this sin or this thing. And you go, oh, that, that wasn't the Lord actually. You kind of missed the calling on that. And you go, where did you hear that? Well, you know, I was at the China Buffet the other day and I broke open a fortune cookie and I felt like that was God speaking to me. He told me to follow my heart. My heart says, remember we, last week we talked about following our heart and allowing those things? The heart is deceitful above all things. And so when God's calling, we need to have a discerning heart. We need to go back to Scripture. We need to ask brothers and sisters. It says many advisors is good. So when you say, okay, God is calling me to this. I think this is what he's calling me. What, what are your thoughts? And being in prayer and working through that. Let's look at verse 13. 
So these all, it's referring to other people he's talking about, these all died in the faith, not having the received the things promised, but having seen them and greeting them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have, have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. That's good stuff right there. We need, we need to hold firm to that. God's gone before us and he's preparing these things for us, exciting things for us. And we need to celebrate that as brothers and sisters. We need to hold firm to those things, especially when things are difficult and you're going, Lord, what? what? What are we doing? And I think one of the most difficult things for us is to put our faith in things that we won't see on this side of, of earth. You know, there's, there's a big movement out there right now in the Christian church in this idea that you can have your cake and eat it now. God doesn't want you to be, you know, without everything that you've ever dreamed and every, every expensive item out there. Um, but we see, we see in Scripture, we see that the people that God called in these areas, they actually didn't see fulfillment of some of the promises until they were dead on the other side of heaven. It says, store your treasures up in heaven, not in earth, where moth and rust can destroy it. That idea of, of sowing seeds that we may not see in our lifetime. That's hard, that's difficult to do. Put it this way. Okay, I come to you, and it's in the spring. You're a, you're a farmer, okay? You put your little farmer hat on, whatever that might be. I, I ask you, I, I say, okay, I need you to sow these seeds for me. I want you to, to get them all ready. Uh, I want you to take your time, but... Also, you're actually uh, going to die in the, before the harvest. You're not going to see these seeds that you planted right now. You're actually not going to see what they come to until, you know, you're going to die. Like, well, that doesn't really sound like a great deal. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to take you up on that. And also, in addition to, you actually have to take care of these things, the, the seeds in the ground. You have to water them. You have to go pick the weeds. You have to do all of this stuff. And, and you still have to do that. You can't just give up on your garden and, and say, well, it, it'll figure itself out. And then you're not going to see that harvest on this side. I can tell you I wouldn't sign up for that kind of deal. I want to see that we, we planted this massive garden thanks to people in this church. Praise Jesus. Because I would have not have done it myself. And, and I can tell you now, I would not be putting in the work the 10-foot deer fence, or elk fence, moose fence, that I had to put around the stinking garden. I would not have put that in had I known I wasn't going to eat all this stuff. In fact, now I'm, I'm already eating things out of the gar garden. My kids don't know this. They do now. Like, where are the strawberries? I thought the strawberry there was a strawberry there yesterday. Now it's gone. I'm, I'm already eating this. We get little pictures of this, right? But think about the things that we do that we don't necessarily see the harvest. We don't see the time. There, there's a story of uh, D.L. Moody, his Sunday school teacher. D.L. Moody, uh, Moody Bible Institute, he, he did not enjoy going to Sunday school and he was done with it. His Sunday school teacher came to him while he was working and led him to Christ. Now, that Sunday school teacher didn't realize the things, the impact. It was just those small seeds. So we don't realize the impact, those small seeds that we have. But God is calling us to still plant and to be faithful. Even when we look at the ground, and it doesn't look like there's anything growing. Lord, I work so hard at this, and I don't see the results of that. That's actually a good place to be in, because God is working through those situations even more than we can comprehend. And there's a cool thing you can read online uh, how from D.L. Moody, uh, there's a path of brothers that were discipled 
to Franklin or to uh, Billy Graham, obviously, and then Franklin Graham as well. So, planting and being faithful, even when we may not see the result of those things, and we may not understand them. And so, I wanted to encourage you today. I want us to be encouraged. I want you to have faith that God uh, sees your sacrifices. He sees the things that you are doing. And I want to encourage you to look at the sacrifices that you're making for him. Are they the weird leftovers in the back of the fridge? Or are you getting out the main meal, the best, the, that weird Wagyu beef stuff, or whatever that is in the Costco magazine that's so expensive? Are you getting out the best for him? I want to encourage to you that God, have faith that your sacrifices will grow. This month as a church, we sponsored 40 children through Panama and through Compassion International. 40 kids that are going to hear the gospel of Christ and be able to come to training centers and to hear God's word. We, we see it as a couple bucks. But again, that seed, those things that are being planted in those beautiful kids' lives, they're going to grow into things that are going to be unbelievable. I have faith that God does a work in them. You guys also gave incredibly generous to, to life services through our baby, baby bottle program. It was perfect. I think it's genius because every kid that walked out of here, every little kid was like, bottle. And they'd grab it and they took it in their parents' vehicles. And then the parents were like, I got to fill. Where did you get that bottle? You just took that from the church. I guess we got to fill it now. Let's bring it back. Right? That's what my kids did. But you guys gave generously to life services. Because we know we have faith that God is doing things through life services. We also are the, uh, the raffle baskets. What a blessing that has been. To have faith that the money being used in those raffle baskets will help the Lamartines and actually help life services as well. Along with this, during Missions Month, um, we have seen people go. We've had Enoch's. In our presence. We've had Abraham's and Sarah's. And when God said, go, Panama, go, help at Awanas, go to these things, these people went. They didn't sit back and say, ah, oh, Lord, i got to figure my stuff out. They, they went forward and did those things. And, oh, that blesses our hearts. I'm so thankful that you've, you've walked with God and been drawn closer to him. And you've seen and we've had people here that trained up dragon slayers through Awanas. We also know that people went to the jungles of Panama to hear Tarzan and to hear God's gospel message proclaimed. We know that God is good because it does not return void. So I'd ask you today, whom do you put your faith in? I want to tell you who to put your faith in today. We need to have faith that when we afflict the comfort in our lives, we have a God who comforts the afflicted. We need to have faith. You need to have faith in God who knows your sacrifices you have made. Because God made, Christ made the ultimate sacrifice for us. We need to have faith that where God guides, he also provides. And that the harvest will far outweigh the suffering. We need to have faith that when the enemy slings fire arrows, that we will be protected by God's armor. And last, I ask that you place your faith in God, however big or small your shield might be today, but to draw him because God has begun a good work in us. And he will complete it and he will see it done today. Amen? Amen. If you have your bulletins, you guys can get those out. Looking at our prayer and pray section. I actually might need a bulletin. Any extras out there? See your prayer list? Go over this week. Praying for those. Praying for our missionaries. Seeing those. Hearing those. Uh, things that they're doing. I would ask, are there any, 
Are there praises and prayers this week? Things going on. What's what's God doing? Yes. Father. Um, you know, I asked for prayer for our traveling, and again, thank you so much for that. Um, we were able to spend two weeks uh, with two different missionaries. Uh, the first week was with the Gitlins. We've supported those guys for 30 plus years. Uh, they came off of the mission field. They were uh, translators to the Mystic Indians. They finished the translation, and now they're doing more administrative things in Chicago. We were able to spend a week with those guys, and the stories they told, I mean, they could write a book about it, and it would just rivet you. Uh, the things that they 